I've just got down to the base of Cortina and I, I was lost for words and I, I felt like, and it sounds really weird, like I felt like crying. I was like, is, is my life ever going to be this good? And so without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome today's guest, which is none other than Simon Burgess. Hey Matt, how are you doing? I'm good. Thanks, Simon. Thanks for coming on. How are you? No problem. Yeah, I'm good, man. Uh, thanks for having me and I'm looking forward to uh, going through some of these videos. Yeah, well, well, we were just talking before we we uh, hit the record button then about how sort of almost therapeutic it was to sort of go through and pick our sort of our favorite videos. Yeah, definitely. Like I was thinking as well, um, sometimes I'm in the car and the music will come on because it will be on my iTunes or something. And it just takes me back to that moment. So I'm not saying that I sit here all day looking back at my videos, but um, they if they do come on uh, or I do feel like going back to a moment, it's a great way to get that experience again. Yeah, for sure. It's uh, it's always nice to sort of, you know, looking back on those memories. So um, how we always start these uh, chats up here on Bramsky Vlogs is we like the, the guests to sort of introduce themselves a little bit, tell them about what it is they do, how um, they are involved within the ski industry, like how they got started. Um, so why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so uh, my name's Simon. I currently have my own website, YouTube channel, um, and I enjoy doing that. It's not my full-time job. I wish it was, but um, I am a maths teacher, a PE teacher, a science teacher. I've probably worked in education now, what are we, uh, 12 years. And it's been a job that's actually allowed me to either take time out to go and do seasons or uh, to use my holiday to go and explore some pretty cool ski resorts. Now, um, during that time, I've taught around the world, so I've spent time in Asia, um, across Europe, uh, Australasia, Canada. So I've been able to take in quite a few ski resorts that way. Uh, in terms of getting into skiing for the first time, uh, university, uh, trip with mates who I lived with, loved it. As soon as university finished, I wanted to go and do one of these gap instructor courses, went did it, got the level two out in Canada, and then spent a couple of years um, doing seasons, teaching it. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's how I got into it. I love it. Just love going to new places, new ski resorts, and hopefully uh, people enjoy when I share that with them. Yeah. How, how did the YouTube channel get started? Do you know, I was on um, just on Twitter, uh, talking with people who are also, also interested in skiing. I came across um, a family, Alba Adventures, and um, they're based out of New York. They do a lot of skiing up at um, Killington. And I, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right, but uh, Pico. And I started to follow their videos. And I was like really impressed by like, this family. They've got full-time jobs and the community that they built. And I was like, well, actually, I am going to some pretty interesting places. And it'd be nice to share that with other people, hopefully be able to help them out with their trips. So whether that is uh, putting together a guide for a ski resort or maybe helping them in gear because I've had experience in the past working in um, ski shops both um, abroad and in the UK. So I just wanted to hopefully meet lots of like-minded people and it's been really good for doing that, um, whether that's getting connections to invites to go to um, the ski show, whether to talk on uh, other channels like yourself, Smat, or people that I've actually been able to meet up and go skiing with. Now, a couple of weeks ago, um, I was out in, I say a couple of weeks ago in October, um, I was out at Landgraf in Holland. Um, and actually there's a, a guy called uh, Chris. Um, he met me at the ski show. Uh, he'd seen a few of the things that I'd done and he was actually in Landgraf as well. So then we went for a couple of laps together. Um, so it's really nice when YouTube then meets the real world and you can go and share that passion together, I think. Mm, yeah, definitely. Um, and yeah, I, I saw I saw some of the stuff you, you got you were involved with at the at the snow show. And it, it, it's great, like you say, when, um, you know, sort of your hobbies cause sort of can go into, you know, making connections and give you fantastic opportunities. Um Okay, well, I mean, let, let's let's dive straight into it because um, I mean, there's quite a lot of videos here, and I, 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 I like looking through it was pretty, um, yeah, I was I was pretty stoked to see all these different places you'd been to and all the experiences. 
Um, so which one, which one are you going to start us off with? Um, well, let's start with North Star over yeah. in California. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I went just before COVID broke down uh, over for a, a few weeks over in California, managed to take in a few ski resorts, but North Star is definitely one of my favorites. I understand that here at North Star, they've got a park for everyone, including one for like six and under. So there should be nice entry level features all the way up to the half pipe. Okay, so talk us through this then, Simon. So you're this is North Star, right? Yeah, this is North Star. So North Star, um, it's one of the Epic Pass resorts. I know they get um, like Vale and Epic Pass get a really bad name, but uh, out on the California trip, I went to Free, Heavenly, Kirkwood, North Star. But North Star in particular is best known for its terrain parks. I think on the day that I was there, there was 144 features across the mountain um, with like little baby parks up to the big stuff. Now, one of the reasons I enjoyed it so much is I'm really scared of the terrain park. Um, it's not something that I feel particularly comfortable with, but they had all the little features that you can see here that you could just ride on. And it just gave me so much confidence that by the end of the day, I was starting to hit some bigger features and uh, it's definitely a place for progression. Is it is it very much a sort of a um, a destination where where that type of thing is like the main attraction, or I mean, what what's the the sort of the general outlay of North Star like? Yes, well, North Star is a strange one. Like, in, it, they give out free champagne, um, <laughs> so it's like a, it's kind of like a, a premium ski resort. There's certain times of the day. There's like a mountain restaurant there called Tost. Um, and everyone goes there, they give out free champagne and then you, you make a toast um, to, um, to North Star and the environment. And like, it, it's a really nice place for that. So I think North Star is an expensive place if you were to go and lodge there and if you're going to pay your lift ticket on the daily. But it's also really popular with families. I mean, the resort itself, it's got its own ice rink, the tubing, really nice beginners area. But from my perspective on wanting to go there, you have this whole mountain dedicated to a uh, terrain park. So lots of different runs down, different sizes, small, medium, large, extra large. Mm. And then the rest of the resort, uh, I had some laps through the backside of it. There's um, really nice tree runs. Uh, we didn't really have the conditions for it, but I bet like after it's had a dump, it would be really, really fun. And um, some nice groomers as well. So it's a good mix of a resort. Um, but definitely more premium in terms of price, I think. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, from the, I guess, from your experience on the terrain park, did you did you come away then feeling quite quite a lot more confident? Definitely. Like as I say, like I'm not big on terrain park riding. It's probably the weakest part of my snowboarding for sure. But yeah. I do enjoy it. As long as I'm kind of within that comfort zone, I do really enjoy it. But you just start off small and then you're like, oh, that one's a little bit bigger and that rail's a little bit longer. And it's really confidence building. Mm. And, and what was it like from a filming perspective? Yeah, so it, it, do you know what? Filming anything on snow, it's just fun. <laughs> like uh, get uh, friends to follow you down and you film them. Um, lots of people out there filming uh, video parts actually or, or film their mates because it happens a lot in the terrain park i do think um filming in in ski resorts you've got to try and mix up the angles as much as possible so it's not just that i'm in front of you face shot which I, i've definitely been guilty of in the past um and remembering that people are there to see the ski area uh, they want to see the beauty in it they don't necessarily want to see this yeah it, I, I know exactly where you're coming from on that <laughs> it is that it, it is that constant sort of push and pull that you sort of you want to give some information like by speaking to the camera so that there is value but then there's also the visual value that you you want to add to that to that video also yeah, it's, well, it's about building that relationship, I guess, with your subscribers and the people who are watching it. Like if people are coming across you for the first time, uh, you want to give off your personality. It's impossible to do that without showing your face and talking to camera. And I, I do enjoy that. But also, 
I'm trying more with my videos now to make sure that maybe the resort is the start. Maybe that is the, the focus of it. And yeah, I'm there and I'm here to help you guys learn about it. Um, but the resort is definitely um, the center of the video, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, well, uh, we'll go on to my first one, which is actually quite a recent video. Um, and we're going to go with the opening day of this winter season at Revelstoke. So, yeah, this was the opening day of the season here at, at Revelstoke Mountain Resort just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, yeah, was pretty uh, blown away by just how good the conditions were for an opening day of the season. Um, the, the, it was sort of just the, the top half of the mountain that is open. Um, that's still the case now, but uh, more snow's coming down anyway. But, um yeah, just as you can see, like the, the powder conditions, there must have been about maybe 15, possibly 20 centimeters of snow on the ground. It was, um, yeah, to just ski through powder on day one was wicked. It looks beautiful, man. Like just the, the spread of the trees and kind of the gradient. It just looks like a really fun resort to kind of just get away from those peaks and go exploring. Is that what you're finding at the moment? Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, there are obviously boundary areas which you don't want to go out with but generally if you sort of stick within the the, the areas that are that are like that there are they're in the back country they're not cordoned off you will sort of find your way back easily to to sort of the piste and the lifts and it's it's not too steep a terrain um at the moment you're sort of just navigating still the odd like small fir tree that's sticking up out the ground and, and everything like that. But, but, but generally it's, yeah, it's pretty, pretty nice terrain to ride on. So quick question for you about kind of the putting of the video together. I love the music. So mm -hmm. it got me thinking, how do you match your music to your, um, to your videos? Do, where do you source it from? Uh, do you enjoy that part of it? No. <laughs> No, is the obvious question because, like, I, it's 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 really hard to gauge, and 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 I I also don't really. It's interesting you ask because I don't know how much of an effect it, how much it influences the audience that what the watch it. Um, I think so, massive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think like that that tune that you've put in there. I'm not sure like where you've got it from, whatever. But as soon as it came on, like my head's going mm -hmm. like this, and mm -hmm. then I'm like, ah, oh, okay, and I know that. For me, watching it, I'm thinking if that's in my ears when I'm skiing through those trees, I'm having a good time. So you did a good choice on that one. I, I have for a long time sort of had the, the, this type of music, which is like, I don't know, it's it's like your typical sort of travel vloggy, very like sort of almost like dance style, which I never really liked, but I never really sort of thought much about, you know, really matching too much with it and then um actually in this in last summer when i was working in a bar and, and and sort of that typical like cocktail bar background music is very much like it's like chilled sort of you know lo-fi or like hip-hop type stuff from that side of thing and i thought about putting that in the, in in videos instead just because it would give a little bit more of a relaxed feel and, and i think yeah, I think like you hit the nail on the head there. Like if I look back at some of my older videos and the music I chose, I went on to the provider that I use, which is Epidemic Sound, and there's loads of others available, but they have their playlist and it's like, oh, this is the travel playlist. This is the, and you're right, it's all that kind of dancing music. And I was like, okay, well, this is kind of where I'm going. And now if I watch those videos, I don't particularly enjoy the music, whereas- no. I, f I think more recently, I try and choose stuff that matches my personality a little bit more and what I enjoy. And I hope that then the people watching or listening enjoy that as well. Yeah, no, mate, totally. Um, yeah, I'm with you there. You look back on some of those ones and you just think actually, uh, in some instances, I always, I've always felt like it's kind of like ruined the video. But that, that's all part of the journey and the experience of, of making these videos anyway. Um, Right, let's go on to your next one, Simon. Which one are we going for? Let's go for 
Madonna di Campiglio, please. Madonna di Campiglio is an area that a lot of people want to go to. Anyway, got past that chair and past that queue, so let's go and explore Madonna. Okay, so Simon, this is this is Italy, right? Is it? Yeah, Italy. So again, um, it was part of the epic pass. So I, I basically knew that I was going to go to California for that first couple of videos, and I was like, where else can I go? And um, this video I particularly like because some of the videos that I really enjoy making um, are the ski resort reviews, and it was my first one of going, okay, really delving in deep and thinking about the process of doing it. What I wanted to show the information about moving around the resort, maybe where the terrain park is, um, why people might travel there over other resorts. And Madonna, like the, the backdrop there of the Dolomites is absolutely stunning. So I just think when all of that came together, it just makes it one of my favorite videos if I'm looking back um, and it takes me right back to that experience. Yeah. I mean, what, what would you say about skiing in Italy because I feel like with Brits it's it, it's 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 sort of there's only like a, a small amount of say like the the actual British ski community that either they know about it or they sort of they like to really go for it um you know it's I not... think, yeah I think a lot of people maybe they overlook it for France and Switzerland and Austria I think um my experience was so the area in total that I went to, in addition to Madonna di Campiglia, it's called the Ski Rama Dolomiti. So it's eight ski resorts, one lift pass, and got to go around a lot of them. Now, some of them are, are quite small. Um, there's one there called Payo 3000, another absolutely beautiful resort, nearly made my list today. Um, so you might only want to go there for, you know, two or three days. A week might be too much if, if you're not a beginner because you might get bored of the terrain. But having the eight resorts within a very small area makes it quite an interesting place to go and ski. Um, in terms of cost, it's much cheaper than going to France, much cheaper than going to Switzerland. And even I think I've, I've personally never, never been, but my understanding of places like Chavinia, so Chavinia is linked to Zermatt and the Glacier. But if you stay in Chavinia in Italy, you're going to have a much more affordable holiday than mm. if you stay in the sw on the Swiss side, but you ski at the same ski resort. So I can de I definitely see an appeal to Italy. I like it. They get more um, days of sun than France, Swi uh, Switzerland, Austria. So if you like your bluebird skiing, um, Italy could be the place for you. Yeah, it, it definitely looks really sunny in this video. Um, I can see you nearly, did you nearly just take out a kid there? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe. And I think maybe that's one of the, uh, sorry, by the way, um, I think <laughs> maybe that's one of the problems of filming as well. Like you're slowly learning that you, you still need to be uh, aware of all your surroundings and making sure that, you know, you're, you're doing everything right. But also sometimes kids are in the wrong. I don't know if this one was, but I'm just going to call it. <laughs> We've all we've all done it at some point, I think, haven't we? We've all we've all accidentally like hit a kid. I don't, I don't know what the air quotes for accidentally <laughs> mean, meaning I did it on purpose. No. No. So, yeah, we've all we've all accidentally um, done, and like I don't know, maybe you've gone into the lift line a bit too quick once, or you've you've missed your turn and you're slidden into someone. It happens, but um, yeah, luckily nobody was harmed in the making of this video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no 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 no. like uh, in, in all fairness like you, you never mean to like hit hit anyone but it does happen and 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 on in reverse as well like kid kids are obviously always too busy like having a bit of a good time sometimes and they'll they'll always um they might ac accidentally like crash into someone um I I like to think that I've got some good karma in the bank because normally <laughs> if if I see someone who has you know fallen over maybe their skis come off or it's got like I'm one of the people who I won't just ski past them. I'll go and fetch their ski or their pole and bring it back, help them get it on. Mm. So uh, I think I've got like a couple of accidental crashes in the bank, uh, at, at least in terms of karma anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I did. a. I, 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 when I was in Austria, I did a, one or two like attempted skiing safe videos. And it all it was all sort of came out of an incident where and I, ha I have it on, on camera in, in the vlog. And I'm skiing from up the hill. There's a restaurant midway down this piece. And it, it's a really busy piece. This 
person's just coming out of the restaurant with their skis like they're just literally walking across the the the, the slope they're not looking up or anywhere they're literally just like minding their own business and um they just sort of went right out went right over me and i sort of luckily recovered but they were just weren't looking at all didn't didn't look uphill or anything i, I, I sometimes think that's like the it's the simplest thing it's the first thing that we ever taught like yeah. when you're when you're getting your lessons it's before you start just look uphill check there's no one coming and mm. but a lot of people tend to forget that right yeah, well, I mean, I know in the FIS code that obviously the, the responsibility would lie with someone like me being uphill, mm. so I've got to make the effort to sort of move away. But when you're on a busy slope, that's sometimes impossible to do. Um, and you're, you're not you're not ex necessarily expecting the person to just go without looking. So they might be stood at the side of the piece and they just head off. I mean, you is i guess risk assessment and being aware of what's what's below you but I, yeah. I do think sometimes they need some sort of uh responsibility as well but just flipping it back to to madonna i think the one regret that i have about this video is like there's a um there's a, a race there um uh, fis race course and just because the race was coming up in like four or five days at the time weren't able to access that run so yeah. I would definitely love to hear from anyone who has um, who has actually taken that run because it did look really cool. So, yeah, definitely that 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 would have been a wicked thing to experience. Um, okay, well, from Italy, we're gonna travel over to Japan, and I'm gonna show um, my experience, my six star experience in Niseko. So um, this was a, a, an opportunity that I had through the, the work that I was doing whilst I was out there um, uh, working as a concierge for a, um, a property management company. And they had some, some suppliers um, who had this um, block of luxury apartments or penthouses i'm not really sure what you want to call them we had the opportunity to go and explore around and i um, mean it was the big sort of revealed day they'd invited all these people from the town to come and have a look around and i mean i don't think i'd ever been in anything like it i mean these places had like their own private onsens um uh balconies that were looking out over the mountains uh, games rooms, like uh, wine cellars, uh, just um, everything, you name it, it had. Um, and, and the reason why I picked this video is because, um, you know, it shows another side of, of the ski industry and what it's like living there. Um, you know, if you um, are fortunate enough to be able to afford to, live like that you know that's how they do um that's one of the things that i really enjoy about your channel because you i mean correct me if i'm wrong but you tend to come at a lot of stuff from a season air work perspective from lots of different places that you've been and it it does give that um first uh, person account of living in those areas and maybe those experiences that um people just having like a fleeting moment so like from this season there'll be lots of Canada stuff for maybe people who haven't experienced Canada or, or, or skiing there or what it's like and I think looking through some of your Japanese content um, it's really nice to see that it's not like everyone knows you know Japan incredible snow mm. um, but do they know about the onsens and yeah. I mean those people banging the drums there and like the, tradi the traditional music and um, the food um, mm. it's really nice to see yeah it, it it is those things like and i think that that has come with actually the more seasons that i've done and the more that i've realized it's not you know when when you're out in the mountains it's not just about pieing all the time it's also about enjoying the 
the cultural or, or the or the act the other active experiences that um, the resorts can offer, um, and and and, and of, often those don't get. Um, I don't think they get enough exposure. I think like a lot of the time, when it comes to like marketing ski resorts to the masses or to you know for seasonal workers or when you see in ski videos a lot of it is always about just you know i you know partying at the folly deuce or, or doing a big powder run but it is those other things it is like you know actually seeing the you know the the aspects of the different aspects of a town and, and what makes it such the locals how they fit into it what are their roles and um yeah whether that's music or running the you know different sides of it yeah but i think um like take you mentioned the onsen for example like when i when i went to japan being british i was like oh i'm not sure about the idea of getting naked and having a bath with like 20 other men yeah. but, but you go and do it and like it's awesome and like some of the locations like the one that i visited in uh Hakuba, it's just stunning. Like you're in this pool looking out at the Japanese Alps. They're just there completely uninterrupted. But like I can get over the fact that we're, we're all sat here naked. Like it's just it, for them and their tradition, it's like that is the cleanest thing to do. So um, you just respect that when you're there and then, you know, get on with the experience. Definitely. Like I, I think um, that th there's a similar experience within Japan is like an, immediately you sort of, you know, you respect the local cultures and and the onsen was just such a part of that, especially in, in the mountains. And, you know, I mean, it's the perfect way to sort of relax from the day off. There's no like massive apres scene in, in Japan. Everyone just sort of either goes off and heads home, has a meal or, yeah, goes and relaxes in the onsens. And um, the, there's quite a few public onsens that you could go to and, and it was we had a similar one that looked out above um looked up towards the slope and there was night skiing in the seco so you could just sit there um you know you're in warm warm onsen and but your head's above and it's like minus eight outside and you know if you've snuck a beer into the public onsen then you 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 you're, you're super relaxed yeah, and just out there watching other people having a good time as well, looking at a night skiing. That does sound like a, a really nice experience, man. Yeah. Okay, so over to your your next one. What what have you got? Do you know what? We're going to stay with Japan. And okay. everything that we just said about, you know, Japan is about more than, um, <laughs> more than uh, the, you know, the, the powder and, and the tree runs. Uh, it is by far the best place that I've ever had for snow conditions in my life. And uh, just looking back at this video, like it just brings me so much joy. There's a shot where I do have that, you know, that front facing camera and it's just face shot after face shot after face shot. And um, I, I've just never been anywhere like it. And I, I just think at um, Hakuba Cortina, where this video was, um, it says, like in the title, it's the best day of snowboarding ever. Um, and for me, that it just was, it was unmatched. And um, I'm yet to, to have a day with snow quality that, that was that good. there's a few times in this video where you just like disappear like you're just like engulfed in powder yeah like I'd, I'd never had that experience before of like you go along and maybe you get like a, a, a face shot in powder but it clears in a second and then you can see where you're going going through the trees at Cortina I was kind of like there was maybe periods of like four or five seconds where you don't know what's happening and you're like oh am I about to go into a tree and then it clears you're like no I'm fine like this is amazing um, and I think the start of the video, I think is me just, I, I'm not sure like whether I'm that emotional in public, but I was like, I was just so emotional in, in that I was like, I've just got down to the base of Cortina and 
I, I was lost for words and I, I felt like, and it sounds really weird, like I felt like crying. I was like, is, is life ever going to be this good? And that might sound like really dramatic, but I'd, I'd had other good powder days in Hakuba, like Sugaigi Kogan, an incredible ski resort, some great tree skiing. But the difference between Cortina and a lot of the other resorts at Sugaigi, at Hakuba 47, um, at Goryu, um, a lot of the tree skiing is limited. Um, so unlike in Europe, uh, at Sugaigi, you have to take a course to go in into their tree runs, their double black diamond runs. Same at Hakuba 47. And then after you've taken the course, you have to go and collect a vest. Um, it's all very well like managed and they just basically want people to be safe. And I completely understand that. But coming from a European perspective where you go to big resorts like Verbier and you can go down the itineraries or, or whatever you want and it's at your own risk. Mm. Cortina was was like that. You had this endless runs like tree runs and just and I'm looking at my face in this video now and I'm just, I'm just blown away by <laughs> I can tell like my reaction. I'm like, I don't know how to put this into words. Like yeah. it, it was just such a surreal experience. And you must have had the same in the Zecco. Mm. I, I, I think there are there are days, especially when you're when when you're someone who who really loves you know being in the mountains. There are those days where it is so good that you know you find yourself with all these different emotions, which they surprise you in yourself. But that's that's the beauty of being in the mountains. That's the effect of what it does. And and yeah, I mean, Naseka was a similar thing there was some really good like tree runs it, it's a different i mean i'm no whole garden it garden person but like um you know the trees are different out there and it, it just it's a lot more wild i found you know um at the start of the winters you, you're sort of still skiing over bits of like bamboo which was an, a, a real surprise but then it's just like these bare trees whereas like if you're in europe or here even here in canada these are like that they they you know they've all still got everything on them it's green caked in snow but out there it's just like this gray wilderness and then with like you know 10 10 inches um 10 meters of snow to to ski through i think it's the first place that i've been where i've been on a chairlift and i think there's a shot of it in the video like i'm i'm on a chairlift and there's other people going down and i'm just as stoked for them skiing in that powder as I would be like if I was, because there's enough of it. Like, I don't need to go, oh, they're tracking that out or, oh, they've come down here. So, or oh, I need to hike up there to get, you know, uh, fresh turns. Mm. I, I just the whole day, I was just happy. And um, I, I managed to meet, like, uh, I was skiing there by myself that day. And I met these this group of guys from Australia and um, met them just before lunchtime. We'd got to the bottom of this run and we all just looked at each other and were like, like this is this is as good as it gets like I've, we're not getting better like better day than this so um we grabbed a bit of lunch then headed headed back out skied with them all afternoon we did the backcountry run between um cortina and norikora which is like one of the neighboring resorts and it was just sharing that experience with other people being able to watch other people having fun and then potentially having my best ever day um i just what yeah. what a memory out of curiosity why why is it also called cortina when because you've got that you've got cortina in italy haven't you as well yeah uh, to be honest i i don't know um i don't think that there's any major um similarities between the two of them mm. um there is there's like an old tudor style hotel at the japanese cortina which um, I've never I've never been to Cortina in Italy, um, but someone said there were some similarities between that and is it Cortina um, in Italy. But I I don't I don't know that. But all I know is it's the best place for conditions that I've ever skied in my life. And one of one of my friends worked out there as an instructor for a few years, and he's back in Europe now uh, teaching in in France. And every year he says. If I was paying my money to go skiing, I don't understand why I would go anywhere else than Japan. Mm. Um, like he works in France because that's where he gets paid the most and like it's his livelihood. Um, but I think for anyone who has had the opportunity to get over there um, and like I was in a busy area. So when you find like those quieter ski resorts that maybe no one's heard of yet, that's yeah. definitely uh, on the bucket list for me.
Yeah, I, I don't really know where the marketing of, of Japanese skiing is at the moment. I mean, about, you know, three, four years ago, pre-COVID, there seemed to be quite a big push to sort of bring J Japan, bring the Brits to Japan. Like I, I remember going to um, the, the 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 final ski and snowboard festival that was hosted by the Telegraph at Battersea, and I remember there was like three or four companies there, all trying to push the, these Japanese destinations. Um, and I mean, I, I I don't know where that's at at the moment, but you know, Japanese skiing. It's becoming more globally known anyway. So, um... I, I just think at the moment, um, COVID's killed it uh, in terms of like being an international destination. I know um, one of one of the guys I met at the ski show, uh, Mike Snow. He is an instructor out in Japan. He is trying to get his visa at the moment to go out, but without having a job there you can't get that visa at the moment is the understanding that I have from the conversations I've had with him. Um, so I think as a tourist, it would be impossible last season. I think it's impossible this season, but when it does open up again, I'll be, you know, one of the first people trying to get over there. And um, not that the Japanese are probably happy about that. They're quite happy to have those ski resorts themselves at the moment, maybe, but yeah, I can see it growing in popularity. Yeah, well, I, I actually there's a there's a YouTuber um, who who's out in Hokkaido, uh, a guy called Neil Hartman, and and he does these uh, videos where he he will basically he'll sort of most of the time he's doing these car vlogs. So he's 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 got the GoPro, I think, and he's talking to the camera as he's driving, and he'll do one in English and then he'll do one in Japanese. And he was actually just talking the other day about what the the sentiment was like last winter when they couldn't have anybody because at the start of the season he said all the locals were thinking oh this is going to be great it would be like you know old times where we you know we've just got all this untouched powder um but he said as the season went on everybody kind of came realized it was quite lonely and you know that actually there was all these big like you know especially in the seco you got all these big properties and all the pubs and restaurants but nobody there um must be really tough like for, for the businesses and all I can you know hope not just in Japan but anywhere that if you you know you've got a ski shop you've got a restaurant you've got a hotel I just I just hope that you can just hold on and we can get this winter and get you some guests and yeah um, I just you know it just has to get back to to some sort of normality for them so we can just continue this sport that we love okay so for the next one uh, I'm gonna take a trip back in time um, this is my sort of end of season edit, as you were, from my very first winter, which was in uh, the Three Valleys, Lehman Weir and Val Terenz. I just remember, I mean, the snow was enormous. We had so much and for... To be with that group of people from start to finish was just such a memorable experience. Like, I, I can't really think of anything, like, bad about that first season. It was, um, some guy on the lift termed it yesterday. It, it was definitely the Liver Olympics, um, that's for sure. Um, but, you know, it had everything. You know, you're in a ski area with hundreds of kilometres of, of runs um you know you're working in the mountains it was just um you know obviously it started off my 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 sort of my real love for for being in the mountains day in day out and you know one, once i did there I never really wanted to stop that life never really wanted to sort of come back and do anything else well i think you chose a pretty good ski area to get started in right so uh val Turen and the you know the free valleys it's such an incredible ski area i mean one of my videos nearly made the list from Arel, uh just yeah. over just over the way and um yeah it was actually the it was the first place that i had a, a snowboard lesson i'd skied before but i learned to snowboard in val Turen. and uh you're right i also had my 21st birthday there so um 
the liver the liver olympics um <laughs> you know it lives strong but what are your you know your endearing memories looking back at that first season um w- w- had you skied a lot before or was it kind of your first uh, no yeah goes? yeah no um i luckily um uh i've sort of my my I had the opportunity to go skiing quite a lot as a young kid, thanks to my family. And so, you know, I already had a love for skiing. Um, um, you know, there'd, there'd been some sort of like in the back of my mind for a long time, I thought, oh, you know, I'd, I'd love to, to, to be able to do, to, to, to work in the mountains in some capacity. But, and, and it's still the same now really, is that I, I never really had a clear vision of what that is. And so, you know, in the end, I just got out there and I mean, some of the, the, the clear memories of that first season, um, the, some of the snow conditions on transfer days caused real issues. Um, you know, there were a couple of times where we were working 17, 18 hours on, on transfer weekends. And I tr- I tried it in a couple of those vlogs to document them quite extensively because I thought that would be quite revealing because it's certainly when you work for a tour operator and, and snow causes chaos, um, the customers are always angry to some degree or another. It doesn't matter like what you try and do to mitigate or, or resolve the issues. You know, it, it's a long day for everybody, um, but you have a job to do. They just want to get home. Um, and, you know, I, I, luckily I wasn't on the receiving end of any, but I know a few people who I worked with throughout my time as a rep that, you know, things do get said, you know, and, and, and uh, at, at you as a rep washed, all you're trying to do is help them. And behind the scenes, you know, you're running yourself ragged across a resort. You're sort of, you know, you're on the phone, you're, trying to sort out emergency accommodation. There's so many different things. And, um, you know, that was a a clear uh, experience that would always stay in my mind. But I look at it as a positive one because things like that help you build a really, really thick skin. Once you've been through something like that, you can sort of go through anything. Um, Obviously, the the APRE scene in, in Three Valleys is just second to none um they there's a really strong british seasonal community there or there was um and they looked after everybody um the highest pub in europe the frog and roast beef um they i remember christmas there we were we did a lock-in and they did everything like chris the full like that was the closest thing to christmas dinner in the uk that you'll ever get abroad and it was yeah just that, it, it sounds in, incredible man and like i'm i'm sorry for reps and uh and kind of what you're describing because you don't control the weather you don't control missed flights you don't control any of that stuff and you know you guys take the brunt of it mm. i bet that like from your perspective has that made a major difference to how you deal with people in customer service roles because like I, the only thing that I can compare it to is um, working in ski retail and people come in, say they try on a jacket and then they don't put it back. Like It yeah. doesn't matter what shop I'm in now. Like if I've taken something off a hanger, it goes back perfect. So that, so that the person working in the shop, you know, doesn't have to deal with it because they've been on the other side of it. Yeah. Like, like what we went through, especially on that weekend, like that was just one weekend you went through, numerous weekends as a rep where where you'd get disruption but going through that and also having to deal with one or two medical emergencies with guests Mm -hmm. like once you've done them you're sort of you feel like you've got experience you've got skills and and you you sort of have a a belief in how you can approach things in in future and that also comes down to some of the training that is really good with tour operators um i think though like some a for the most part, those like harrowing experiences are sort of a thing of the past. Like the the number of reps now and not it's it's not as big as it was maybe sort of like five, ten years ago when the package holiday was so popular. You know, loads of people like to sort of book their own type of holiday now. Um, you know, what with 
advert things like Airbnb and Skyscanner, it's it's easy to kind of just pick and choose and and sort of do things also on the cheap. But yeah. Um, yeah, listen, let's go on to your next video. Um, so what have we got? We have got uh, a video from Queenstown uh, where I went to the two ski resorts in Queenstown, uh, Remarks and Coronet Peak, on the same day. One of the reasons that I chose this video is, for me, it kind of has a good mixture of a lot of different bits of snowboarding. Um, first of all, like started the day with um, some park riding up at Remarks. They're they're really well known for you know their terrain parks, and we'd we'd had a lean um, a lean winter there. Uh, there wasn't too much fresh snow, but they did a great job of like grooming, putting features out. And again, similar to what I was saying to North Star, they made sure that they had those smaller features. So I was kind of comfortable and other beginners or intermediates were, you know, comfortable doing those uh, basic terrain park features. But then to the side, they had um, some huge jumps and it was just nice, like watching people and, and seeing what they can do. Um, as the day progressed at Remarks, uh, did some hiking. It's such a cool resort for like inbounds hiking. Uh, there's so many different areas where you can just take a chairlift and then maybe 10 15 minute hike up and you're in just a beautiful area away from you know the crowds the shoots um probably an area that i'm you know really i made a few videos about it but some nice runs down um and remarks was definitely a highlight but i think what i like about this video in particular is it shows that you can do both in one day um you go to remarks in the morning and then coronet peak I think three or four times a week puts on night skiing. So um, headed back down into Queenstown, uh, picked up a Domino's pizza, which uh, I think I put in there that I'm, I, I really wasn't happy about it because in New Zealand, you get a large Domino's for five or six dollars. And uh, in the UK, you'll know same pizza, exact same uh, cost us 17 pounds. I don't know if you, if you can explain that one. Yeah. Uh, so this was a legit Domino's, right? Yeah, legit from Domino's. And to be honest, I've, I've been in the US as well. So in Tahoe, I reckon a large Domino's pizza was probably about $10, right? Yeah. So US, $10, maybe that's seven or eight pounds current conversion rate. I think the conversion rate for $6 large Domino's pizza is about three or four pounds. And in the UK, it costs us 17 pounds. Same company. I know they're probably affiliate or, or whatever. But if anyone who knows anyone who works at Domino's, whatever, let's start a campaign here and now to get fair pricing for pizzas in the UK. Um, I'm going to start a crusade. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let, let me know, know and I'll, I might join you on that. Um, <laughs> but j just looking at this video again, like, I mean, you'd be mistaken for thinking that you were skiing in the Alps there. Yeah, I mean, the <laughs> Remarks uh, itself is a beautiful ski resort with some really challenging terrain. It's small, though. And I think that's from a, coming from a European perspective. A lot of us maybe look at these ski resorts and go, well, it's not worth it. Because if you take Fred Bow in Australia, it's 600 meters of vertical drop or Perisher is 300 meters. Remarks is I think is about uh, four or five hundred meters top of my head. Coronet Peak is only a few hundred meters. It's like, well, we're used to resorts that have got maybe a thousand meters or some more than that, you know, huge resorts. But what they do have down there is um, some really nice terrain. The views from Coronet Peak are amongst some of the best views that I've, um, I've ever experienced in a ski resort. Um, Lake Wakatipu is just there. You, for night skiing, you get the sunset there. It's gorgeous, man. Mm. awesome yeah it's uh it, it it's definitely an, an area which uh I, I'd, I'd like to one day sort of ski in new zealand because you know I, i've sort of i've heard mixed things but the more i look into it and the more i think just actually to to experience a different like mountain vibe a different i mean i mean 
Kiwis are great people as well. Like, you know, for sure. Uh, yeah. You know, and I've worked with a few who were super passionate about skiing, and all they said was just positive things about skiing in 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 New Zealand. Look, I, f- I think if you're as passionate about skiing as as I think you are, and that comes across in like your videos, even if you went in like the worst snow season that they have in fifty years, yeah. you will still have a good time, man. Like, there's there's so many cool ski resorts there. You you've got the you know, the big name kind of your commercial ski resorts. You've got um, Remarks, Coronet Peak and Mount Hutt, which are all on the the same lift pass with Mm -hmm. NZ Ski. Um, You've got um, Treble Cone over in Wanaka, uh, Cadrona, also just outside of Wanaka. Um, And then you've got like all the little clubbies. So um, Mount Dobson, like these, uh, I can't pronounce it right, but uh, a how... O-H-U-A, I think, top of my head, probably got that wrong, but um, little private run club ski fields um, where they've just got like the, the pommel lift, like a, they call them a nutcracker, um, and you, you just go and have, you know, a good time out there. It's lovely. <laughs> nutcracker. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you've mentioned quite a bit, actually, of, of these sort of like these these big passes. Is, is that sort of what you've you've used when you've gone and done sort of these filmings in all these different areas? Yeah. Like I sometimes I, the, probably the argument that I have the most of people about skiing is like, Oh, it's, it's too expensive. Why don't you ski? Oh, it's too expensive. It doesn't have to be expensive. Um, take this winter uh, coming up. My season pass was under 300 pounds and it covers um, 30. no, Sorry, it's gone up now. 40 ski resorts across Switzerland called the Magic Pass. Um, when I bought the Epic Pass, it, it is expensive. Like, it's £700. But yeah. with, with that, like, ski in Japan, uh, in uh, North America, so the US and Canada, um, in Europe, so France, Italy, Switzerland, you could – the original plan before COVID was to also take that pass to Australia. They've got mm-hmm. free resorts down there. So – there's ways around it. Um, And that was kind of the idea with the New Zealand trip is to use this NZ ski pass at the time. It was, I think on the early bird, it was 500 maximum. I paid was 600 New Zealand dollars. So again, a few hundred pounds UK. Um, And I went for seven weeks, camper van drove around. And uh, yeah, I think, I think for me, you can find ways if you are going to go for a prolonged period of time with these passes, where you could make a seven week trip cost the same as, you know, one or two weeks of going to say a Verbier and staying in a proper plush hotel. Yeah. No, so that's a really interesting point. Um, okay. Right. Let, let's get on to the next, next one. Um, this for me, this is um, one of my many sort of sat down in front of the camera at home during lockdown pieces. Joining the Season Air community is one of the most memorable things you will do in your lifetime. I'm just talking about the pros and the cons of doing the ski season. One of the, um, you know, one of, one of the, the, the things I've really enjoyed about making videos is actually the engagement that you get from people watching the videos. Um, and, and building a, building an audience um, and and when they ask you a question I, I do get quite a lot of people that will ask about sp- certain things to do with the ski season whether that's like finding a job or accommodation or you know ha- ha- what do you do with a lift pass for example and um, yeah this video I just sort of sort of sat down and put on my thoughts and just said well look here here are the pros and but there are negatives to it as well um you know things like you 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 are spending a lot of time away from your sort of friends and family you're gonna miss birthdays and christmases and and all of that um but the beauty is is that you have the mountains as your office yeah I, i think uh nail on the head there's definitely some downsides but i think the positives definitely are the um the stronger um and personally i came across some experiences when on when on a ski season you know that were negative and hard like 
Um, my grandfather was very ill when I was working in Canada and I actually chose to fly back mid season, um, say my goodbyes. And then I did fly back out and finish the season. Um, it's, I know a lot of people who've missed out on moments like that from being away and also the celebrations, you know, weddings, birthdays, all of that sort of stuff. But I think your videos that you put out like that, I think some of the first videos of yours that I watched were the um, Canadian IEC um, application for, for your visa. And the first thing that made me think was when I was applying for my visa, I wish these videos were here because um, there was some really good information in those. And I, I love that perspective about your channel. Oh, thanks, mate. I'm, I'm actually trying to look for like similar style videos for like information on applying for permanent residency because I try and look on like the moving to Canada website and, 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 and the information is just so overwhelming. Um, it's hard to sort of relate to things and find what applies. But yeah, I, I just sort of thought whilst whilst I started on that experience, still not knowing actually whether I was going to get that visa to go to Canada anyway, I thought, well, you know, if, if, if seven or eight videos come out of it that, that, that prove some use to people, then then great and yeah it seems to have uh, seems to have done that um yeah i think anything anything that makes um it easier for people because the canadian working visa is not an easy thing to navigate like mm -hmm. definitely not and i think with some of the other places that you've been it would be really interested to like have a retrospective how you managed to you know get a visa to work in japan was that a similar like a working holiday visa experience <laughs> It was. So I I did one or two videos at the start of um, doc, that were documenting my trip down to London once or twice to get um, uh, to get the, to apply for the visa. Um, and I did it in like a, like one of my more sort of normal like a vlog style. And on reflection now, that wasn't a good way to do it because actually you know a lot of the time you've got to be doing stuff at a laptop and sat down um and so that's why i sort of did that with with this one um but yeah it's uh I, I, i've talked recently actually about japan i think just before i came out to canada because one of the things i hadn't talked about was like how much money you can earn as a seasonaire and luckily, I still had some of my old pay slips from Japan around, so I kind of used that as a bit of a as an example. Because again, like that's an area which not a lot of people think about when they're coming to do a ski season and sort of the cost of living. Um, well, it's de definitely sorry, just to, like on that point, and that varies so widely, doesn't it? Because yeah, um, so not the exact figure I don't think but I think instructing in Canada as as a level two I was probably on about 14 15 dollars an hour mm. um, whereas you compare that to instructing in Australia I was on about 26 dollars an hour which I think was is about uh, 16 to 18 pounds I'm not sure and um, so there's there's definite differences and um, understanding that before you go really important yeah Right, we, we, we're, we're sort of we're breezing through these. We're on to our, our final ones each now. Um, what have we got for you, Simon? Yeah, so I've, I've, I've gone with the obvious. Probably my most popular video um, that I've released. Um, uh, you know, I think at the moment it sits about 19,000 views and it's something that I really enjoyed doing. And uh, this is everything about snowboarding at Heavenly Ski Resort. You can probably take one of my favourite runs. Ridge Run. It probably has one of the best views in the resort. You ride down with beautiful panoramic views across Lake Tahoe. This this makes me think that sometimes, you know, I, I take the approach wrong and I look at this video as I should be doing this more. Now, I knew that when I released this video, it would get more views than um, my stuff at North Star and Kirkwood because Heavenly is just a more searched resort. Um, and part of the, the thing that I struggle with is I, I'm not a big fan of going to ski resorts with like lots of crowds and I like to try and find like kind of unique places. Now, the problem with doing that and um, also being trying to, you know, grow a YouTube channel and put out content that people actually want is there's a sacrifice to be made there. Because if I'm talking about like one of my favorite videos besides Cortina in Japan is a place called San Osaka. Now, 
it's only got like two or 300 views, but it's one of my favorite ski resorts I've ever been to. But because people haven't heard of it, they don't search it. But one of the things I really like about this, um, this heavenly video is I feel that people have found it useful. Um, the majority of comments or, or questions that, that have been put underneath it are like really nice or they're asking for help and um, I'm more than happy to you know help them and if you can put out content that then people are finding useful then it's um it's definitely a positive yeah yeah for sure um you know I think um I think you touch on a really good point actually about that compromise between the stuff that that you enjoy that the places you enjoy skiing or, or the stuff that you enjoy filming contrasted with actually the fact that, you know, uh, if you want to sort of grow a bit of an audience and start creating a bit of a community, um, you've got to put yourselves in their shoes. And, and, and that's really hard to do. I struggle really hard to do that. Um, you know, especially well, in like after you've done, after I've done like those first 200 videos, I keep sort of, start trying to tell stuff okay it, you know these videos shouldn't just be about you going hey look at me i'm skiing i'm i'm having a good time it's actually you know okay well what what do that community like to do where do they like to go um what might they not know that would be useful to them well definitely and i i, I already know in terms of so the road trip that i'm planning to take in the next few weeks um, takes in 14 ski resorts in Switzerland. Yeah. And I, I know from that 14 ski resorts, 13 of which are going to have bad search results on YouTube, yeah. but I really want to go there. Yeah. And uh, I think the one that doesn't will be Sasfe because most skiers, especially in Europe, will have heard of Sasfe. I, I'm going there for a week because I thought, um, in fact, I think it might be 10 days of my trip I'm going to Sasfe mm. um, because I know that um, if I put out content from there, it's more likely to get viewed. But the whole idea behind my channel and hopefully how I help people is um, going to be along the lines of taking them to new places. So if I end up going to um, to Grimentz, Zinau, Laysin, um, there, there are other places that people know, like Diablo Ray and Glacier 3000. But the majority, you know, I, I think my channel would be more successful if I bought an Epic Pass every year and just went to... And, and like maybe an icon pass and did uh, Squaw Valley, which is now Palisades, Mammoth, um, went over to Killington. Like there's so many different places that would get more views. Yeah. But are they necessarily the places I want to go and ski? Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a, you've hit the nail on the head. Um, okay, let's uh, go on to the last video, which... Um, for those of you who who follow me before, you'll know that this is probably my personal favourite. I've talked about this several times, um, uh, which is heli skiing in Lathuil in Italy. This was sort of like above my wildest of dreams to have done something like this. Um, it's an entirely different way of skiing, of exploring the mountains. Um, and I, I just, I like, I, I remember that, that the moment you jumped in the helicopter, um, and, and then sort of as it lifted and your stomach's just sort of like lifted off the ground, but the, the, the scenery was just remarkable. Um, you sort of, you're on the, we, you can't heli ski in France, but you can in Italy. So we were on the French Italian border. Um, we drove to La Rosier. Um, we went up over on the side to um, La Thuil, which is on it in the Italian side. And, and we got picked up from there and it was like a two minute thing, the helicopter and, just the terrain that you reach you, you, is it's it's unmanageable. Like you wouldn't think that that was just a couple of minutes away in a helicopter, and um, it was safe. You had guides there, and 
everybody had GoPros. So there was a few different angles that I used from different people, which I think helped. Like I, I didn't want it to just be my helmet. But um, yeah, um, stoked to have been able to have done that and would love to do it again. Very jealous, man. It looks absolutely insane. So good. I think I've, I've been in a helicopter once uh, in New Zealand, but sadly I didn't have uh, my snowboard with me. Yeah. Um, so to be able to do it and go skiing is uh, definitely, you know, bucket list stuff. And do, is there any understanding as to why it's not allowed in France, but you can pop over the border? No. Um, and I think it's a similar thing in Austria. Um, there might only be like one place possibly lack i think but i think it's all I, I i it's all legal stuff and i would love for someone to be able to actually explain it to us um but yeah it, 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 i think you used to be able to in france sort of 10 15 years ago but um yeah i don't i don't know why why the reasoning of that is because it certainly has got the terrain one common myth which i will clarify now because i do get asked this quite a few times because of this video do you jump out the helicopter no you don't jump out the helicopter you don't need to because you're hanging on the bottom as it goes up right <laughs> yeah yeah no absolutely <laughs> now you you have to sort of crouch down as you're coming in and out of the helicopter because the the, the the draft from the rotors could you know could suck you up so yeah you always want to be um be careful for <laughs> How, um, if you don't mind me asking, like, so how many runs, and do you remember kind of how much it would cost at the time? Or um, we, so we just did one run um, because we, we to to share the cost, we went with a random group of people. It, they just sort of put these two groups together and and took us up there. Um, obviously, if you were wanting to do a group, your own group, then I think the cost of that would be significantly more. Um, I, I don't know if I'm being honest. I, I wouldn't want to sort of do a false figure. I, I think it's one that if someone's interested in, then they need to sort of get in contact with companies and explore the different ways. But it was, um, yeah, it was one run. Um, we got up there and it, it probably took about an hour and a half to, to two hours to um, get all the way down. We ended up back in the bottom of the resort in Lathuil, um, which was awesome and then we we got the gondola back all up to the top and ski back down into la rosier but it was um yeah really 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 good um experience and i'd recommend if anyone gets the opportunity that they take it it can be quite scary like if you've never done it before like the idea of doing it but i mean you you're always going with guides and they know the ta that terrain they've skied it multiple times they know the danger areas they keep you away from it so they make it safe and enjoyable for you at the same time from a um from a video perspective did you have any like special considerations were you like right guys i'm gonna get out and then <laughs> i need to film you guys get out or were you just so stoked on it you're just like right let's just get on yeah no i i didn't really have too much like i said like there was I was wearing, I think, so I think the company we went with, they they gave us a bunch of GoPros. So I was actually carrying, I actually had two. I think I had one on my helmet and one on my chest. My dad also had one. So when it came to it, I had like a couple of different cameras to actually do a few angles on. But I, 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 I wasn't at that stage with my cinematography where I was thinking much about like, like angles and stuff like that. It was literally like, yeah, just, trying to capture it from from my point of view and my favorite moment is that bit where i'm at the top of my my run and then i say like three two one drop in because you know that's what you see on all the videos and then it's everyone just gets you know and goes and has a whale of a time so that was sort of the only thing i wanted to really get on the camera at that time <laughs> um it's listen uh, simon we, we, we're we've sort of we've got to wrap things up um the one thing i just want to ask you a bit about is um your your planned trip to switzerland you, you touched on a little bit a minute ago um what what have you got lined up so the idea is magic pass road trip um meant to leave next friday um with complications in the UK at the moment with PCRs and potential uh, travel restrictions, Saturday at the latest, I'll be out of the country, but um, oh, as long as nothing changes. From there, I'm going to take um, 
lace in as the first stop for a couple of days, uh, head across to Sass Fay, which is the furthest part on my trip, spend Christmas and, and New Year there before then heading back along and ticking off. I think it's a total of 14 ski resorts um, across the nine or 10 weeks. That that sounds like a really fun adventure. Um, I, I, I bet you're looking forward to it. Oh, I'm so excited. Um, I was just like, I've, downstairs, there's a room. I've, I've got all my stuff. It's laid out. I'm just trying to decide what to have. I'm a bit of a gear geek. Um, how many snowboards do I need for, for, for 10 weeks? Is one okay? Do I need four? Um, <laughs> and I think the thing that I'm most excited about is um, quite a lot of the ski resorts have got some nice um, touring or some um you know, terrain that is uh, listed within the ski resort as kind of um, routes that you can go ski touring or split boarding. Um, and it, I've done it here in the UK, but I want to do some more of it out in resort. And before going into the proper backcountry, um, having those facilities in a resort um, definitely are a little bit more confidence building and hopefully surrounding myself with um, friends and, and other people who, who have done a lot of it before. Hmm. Simon, listen, if, if people want to find you on um, YouTube, on social media, wh where do they need to go? Yeah, so um, website is simonjackburgess.com. Uh, that's where a lot of my um, resort reviews or gear reviews um, or uh, pretty much everything will eventually end up on, on, on the website. Uh, the name that's on the screen, at Simon J. Burgess underscore, is the same for Twitter and Instagram. And if you just uh, search Simon Jack Burgess on uh, YouTube, should come up uh, and I'd like anyone who wants to check it out, drop me a message and uh, I'd love to get in contact with you guys. Hmm. Well, listen, Simon, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, sort of talk to your, your, your videos um, and yeah, wish you all the best for your, your trip to Switzerland. Cheers, Matt. Like honestly, really appreciate it. And uh, I'm keeping an eye on what's happening over in Revelstoke. So uh, keep enjoying the conditions and hopefully we'll chat soon. Yeah, let's uh, let let's um, touch base again later on in in the winter, and we can talk through how how all the experiences have gone. Certainly, sounds great. All right, cheers, Simon. No worries. And thanks everybody for watching today. I hope uh, you've enjoyed the the video where we we've sort of shared our five favorite videos, um, and I've sort of been really enjoyed us exchanging that we've both been to different places but also shared some sort of similar sentiments when it comes to uh, the beautiful sport that is uh, skiing if you have enjoyed today's video then please do like this video also make sure to leave a comment and if you haven't already then subscribe to the channel we are approaching 800 subscribers can we reach it before christmas uh let's see if we can uh, i'll put all of simon's information in the description below so by all means go down there go check out his channel and subscribe to him also thanks very much for watching guys and i'll see you in the next video